Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm your host, Duke Oishi. And I'm your co-host, Maria Kasham. Hydrogen vehicles are coming to Hawaii. In many ways, they are more efficient than pure electric vehicles, and we need to be ready for them. Hydrogen burns without a visible flame. Firefighters need to know how to handle this, so we joined them last week for their training. The Honolulu Fire Department Training Center is on Valkenburg Street, just Eva of the airport. It's a very nice and spacious facility. We found the training center filled with firemen from all over the state. It was moving to see so many firefighters in the same room. They had come to participate in training offered by a mainland company that travels from state to state training firemen on how to handle hydrogen vehicle fires. First, we attended the opening lecture in their hydrogen fire training program. As you will see, the instructors are very competent, caring, and concerned. I'm Scott Jones, been with the uh, Hanford Fire Department for approximately 24 years. I work for what's called the Hammer Training Center. You'll hear a little blurb about it on this, on one of the videos. Um, I've been with the Hammer Training Center for pretty much 14 years. Uh, we also have been in, or I've also been involved with this this whole program, this hydrogen program, since the beginning. Uh, when we brought in firefighters and engineers from across the country, and got your input to put this program together, so this thing has been molded and tailored to meet the first responders' needs and what they were looking for, and eliminate a little bit of the detail. I'm James Bryan. I'm a captain in operations with the Hanford Fire Department. The Hanford Fire Department is located on the Department of Energy facility in the middle of central Washington, as Scoot had mentioned. That's 560 square miles of desert. For some reason, the Department of Energy thinks that locating hazardous facilities in the middle of nowhere is probably a good idea. Uh, the Hanford site specifically is a former Manhattan Project facility. So any of you guys familiar with what the Manhattan Project was? Okay, so that was when at the end of the Second World War, they were racing to build the first atomic bombs. So the Hanford site actually created most of the plutonium for our nuclear weapons arsenal. The things that the Hanford Fire Department spends most of, the time, most of its time doing is uh, first and foremost wildland firefighting because of the area we are. It's the middle of the desert and has a lot of scrub, scrub brush and things like that. Uh, that's probably one of our primary issues that we worry about. Secondary, we have EMS and then hazmat, and so those are kind of like the big three that we deal with. The thing that I'd like to share with you guys today is that we're here to talk with you guys about fuel cell vehicles. We want you to feel comfortable that should you have to respond to a fuel cell vehicle emergency or a vehicle emergency that involves hydrogen, that you guys have the knowledge and the abilities and the skills to deal with that, okay? These are going to be the topics of, of discussion today. Um, Jennifer's going to cover those first three, basically fuel cell basics, um, where hydrogen comes from, how it's produced. Then she'll go over the hydrogen vehicles, uh, the anatomy of them, and all the safety features. And same thing with stationary facilities. Then James will go over the emergency response. Uh, he's got some pretty good detailed information to uh, make you feel better about it. Um, we'll do, at that point, we'll probably end up going outside somewhere either after James starts his, his section or before he starts it. We'll go um, outside and have a look at uh, the prop and do a demo out there of the hydrogen fire. And hydrogen's actually been used in industry for decades with a really good safety record. It's just putting it into a vehicle whether it be an ICE or a fuel cell, or into a bus and, and transporting us, that's a little bit newer application. But it's been produced and shipped and used in industry for decades. In fact, NASA's used fuel cells since the 1960s on their spacecraft. And um, refineries use a whole lot of hydrogen to clean up gasoline. It's one of the biggest uses. We do have to produce hydrogen because it doesn't occur naturally as just the H2 molecule. And we produce it from stuff that contains it. So natural gas, uh, CH4, has a lot of hydrogen, and they do steam methane reforming in industry predominantly to, to make it. Okay? So the industrial gas companies like Praxair, Air Products, that's how they produce the hydrogen. Natural gas reforming is the predominant method. However, 
we really want to see hydrogen going to a renewable pathway. And honestly, the state of Hawaii, you guys have a lot of opportunity for that, and that's fantastic. Because it promotes energy independence, local sustainable energy source, and, and renewable with no emissions, potentially, zero emissions. Hydrogen itself is colorless, odorless, non-toxic, non-corrosive. It will be an asphyxiant in an enclosed space, but you know, you don't want to huff it, it's not going to make you high or anything. Um, it'll make you pass out. So how do we detect it? We'll talk about that. How do we detect a potential leak? It is a gas at ambient conditions, okay? So ambient temperature, pressure, hydrogen's a gas. And it's actually a very light gas, which is why they put it in the Hindenburg. It's great for airlift, okay? Hydrogen's also a cryogen. Can anyone tell me what that means if something's a cryogen? You guys deal with cryogenic stuff, right? Liquid nitrogen, stuff like that. If it's a cryogen, it means that it has to be this cold, minus 423 Fahrenheit, in order to liquefy. So pressurizing gaseous hydrogen does not make it liquefy. It has to get to that minus 423 degrees. Pretty hard to keep it that cold, too. But the fuel cell vehicles and the ICE vehicles, the Fords we're talking about, using pressurized gaseous hydrogen. Is there going to be any liquid phase in that tank? No. So pure hydrogen obviously doesn't have any carbon. Carbon's what gives a flame that color. So the nighttime flame that you could see, probably stuff on that burner that was other products of combustion that was giving it some color. Okay. Um, the thing that I need to explain is that for the vehicles, they're storing pressurized gaseous hydrogen. We like to keep that fuel in the tank. That's where it belongs. Okay. The reason that a vehicle will need to vent is because the car's on fire probably from another fuel, gasoline, diesel, something, okay? Because if that tank, pressurized tank's getting cooked by heat, what's happening to the gas in there? It's heating up too, and the pressure's rising, right? So in that case, there's a thermally activated pressure relief device that will melt open, vent the contents of the tank. If you have hydrogen venting into an ignition source, Chances are pretty darn good you're going to see that flame because you have all that other product, all that other stuff that's burning, right? What else burns in a car fire? Rubber, paint, plastic, all that good stuff, right? Asphalt. So in a vehicle situation, you're going to see that. And you're going to hear it because it's a very high pressure vent. They sort of highlight the fact it has a wide flammability range. Yes, we know that. But gas sensors that are on vehicles, the GM outside happens to have seven of them right now. It's a hydrogen gas sensor. They're also in repair facilities. They are um, employed in the dispenser cabinets at stations. They are calibrated around this lower flammability limit. Okay? So we want to detect a leak right away, and we want to ultimately shut down whatever's happening in that system if that leak gets to around half of this LFL, so about 2% in there. Okay? We don't ever want to get up towards this 29% most easily ignited mixture. Then we were lucky enough to see an outside demonstration of the hydrogen fire training equipment, including a mock-up hydrogen vehicle built to burst into flames. All right, the first one will get the hydrogen flame out the top. You can probably see the thermal waves coming off of it. Okay, so now we'll do the flame with the air. And this gives us our dash fire with the propane. Although it, you can't see it that, that easily, you can hear it pretty good. Yeah, and that's 90 PSI, but yeah. it's pretty loud when you're really venting one. So if I were close to that, if I were on top of that and near that, what would it do to me? If you're close to this, with the, just the hydrogen fire, you're not going to know that there's a, unless you see the thermal waves or you have a thermal imaging camera, you're not going to know there's really fire there until you're right in it. Because there's no radiant heat. So it comes from cool to moving an inch and it's hot. So a little 4,010 degrees is what it burns at. Well, so what are the basic techniques that they're going to learn about? Uh, the main thing is they're going to use most of their own standard operating procedures to approach like any other car fire. If they know it's a hydrogen fueled cell vehicle, 
they'll basically be using their thermal imaging cameras to look for fire or they'll be listening for the sound. Okay, so this is a, a, this is a typical thermal imaging camera. Although there are many styles, a lot of them even smaller than this, the newer ones. But this is what enables the firefighters responding to something like this to, to see the, the flames. Uh, the flame temperature actually like 4,000 degrees, but with uh, very little radiant heat, no carbonaceous material in it, there's no visible flames. So this is what allows them to, to see that, stay out of danger. We have some major hydrogen demonstration projects uh, ramping up here in Hawaii which will involve vehicles. Uh, we have a hydrogen production station on, on the Big Island that we're developing at the geothermal plant. We'll be using that hydrogen to fuel uh, buses operated by the County of Hawaii and also Hawaii Volcano National Park. And here on uh, Oahu, I'm putting in a hydrogen fueling station at the Kaneohe Marine Corps Base. We'll be fueling the General Motors Equinox vehicles to start with, uh, at least five of those. It's really an excellent opportunity for us to be able to see firsthand what these type of vehicles uh, have, what their dangers and hazards are, as well as how to effectively mitigate those things. It's a little ahead of the curve. Uh, it's not open for consumers just yet, but it's good to have the training ahead of time, get people aware of what's going on and what the changes in technology are. Then we took a short ride in a General Motors test hydrogen car. It was high-tech, high-torque, and smooth as silk. We love driving it. Unfortunately, hydrogen cars like this one are still in development and are not ready for prime time, so you can't buy one just yet. This, electric, uh, fuel cell electric vehicle this is the Equinix, the more, General uh, Motors hydrogen fuel cell more. car. Uh, this, current one this is twice as efficient as an electric vehicle. Hydrogen. So what's different with hydrogen and fuel? We're using it fills fuel up with four gallons. kilograms of hydrogen. With hydrogen, we do it. With gasoline you measure in gallons, with hydrogen you measure in kilograms. The energy in one kilogram of hydrogen is roughly equal to the energy in one gallon of gas. So four gallons of hydrogen is equal to four gallons of gas. Carol Motors says the range of this vehicle is 200 miles. With the user in Hawaii with a lot of stop and goes and a lot of freeways, the average range is more like 150 miles. But a 200 mile range is not just theoretical, it can be done and has been done in Hawaii. These vehicles are being demonstrated in Hawaii by the Department of Defense, including the Army, the Air Force, the Navy and the Marine Corps. They're at Fort Shafter, Hickam, Pearl Harbor and Kaneohe. So they've been out in the They've wild. been here in Hawaii uh, for a year and a half now. A year and a half or so now here in Hawaii. And How many are there? There's 16. Right now 16. there are 16 of them in Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes. So we have a, a global fleet of about Worldwide, General Motors has a fleet of about 100 of them. This is an extension them. of Project Driveway, but, but it's not Project Driveway. So essentially in 2000. These cars are an extension of General Motors Project Driveway, but they're designed for regular people. Regular people and influential people. Just to really drive the vehicle, and that helps us collect all the data. Testing these cars, had, uh, so far General Motors has accumulated 2.5 million miles of driving data. So where do I, where do I but these them? cars are not uh, ready for the market, ready, and you can't uh, buy them just yet. yet. Brakes really nice. Is this got the brake system? Yes, where... you have the regenerative braking. Oh, and that's, and that feels good. You're driving right now, but I'll explain the screen a lot better so you can okay, put your ahead, eye on there. Explain it. So basically, the green is the hydrogen coming out of the tank, going mm -hmm. to the fuel cell stack. And then any excess energy or regenerative braking shows as orange that then goes back to the, the battery. The blue is the, um, the water that goes to the exhaust, which is their byproduct. So in order to keep this thing going, all I need to do is fill it up with what? If gaseous hydrogen stored at 10,000 psi is the maximum. So it's a tank of compressed... Compressed hydrogen. If I want to fill the tank in this car mm -hmm. with uh, hydrogen, how long does it take me to do that? Um, if you if you chill, chill it first, so, and you store it at a higher pressure, you can fill it as fast as in five minutes or so. But currently we, we are not doing that in Hawaii since what we have is just a compressor. We're just compressing it and it's temperature dependent as well. 
but we do have stations you know in California that's able to do that I want one I can't get mine soon enough. Then we return to the training center to catch the end of the program and speak with some of the instructors and firefighters about the program and the risks of hydrogen fires. Fuel cell fork trucks, um, industrial trucks, is another really big application for fuel cells. So pallet jacks, forklifts, things like that. The Department of Energy actually co-funded quite a few projects early on and then industry really saw a benefit quickly and has invested privately in these. Some of the advantages are um, you save space with the space it takes for battery charging, so you can free up some space. The manpower in switching out the packs because they fuel in a couple minutes and off they go. Um, you get nice long run time and again, clean, quiet, zero emission. So here's a list of some of the industrial um, like producers and um, central production plants that are using these in their warehouses. And the setup for fueling is you have indoor fueling with a dispenser of some kind. So there's a user getting ready to fuel the forklift. And then all of the hydrogen storage, any production, anything needed for the station is outside of the warehouse. Bulk hydrogen storage, usually we're talking about liquid hydrogen because you can get a lot more energy in the liquid um, than you know, gaseous storage potentially. So liquid storage is in larger tanks. Um, personally at our station in West Sacramento, we store 4,600 gallons of liquid, which we then vaporize to gas and compress and dispense. Here's an example of a mobile fueler. So this is essentially a tube trailer with a dispenser on it. They can take it to any location with, of course, siting and permitting and the appropriate uh, protocols and set up for fueling, okay? They call it an HF-150. And this is another example of a tube trailer. So that's one way of setting up a station. Um, and there are stations that exist whereby they swap out a tube trailer. So they bring one, hook it up to the station. When it gets low or empty, they bring a full one, swap it out, okay? The whole point behind every station is we want to store buffer storage for dispensing to the vehicles. Liquid delivery, again, um, our station we get liquid. This Bending Road station had liquid, that underground tank that you saw um, earlier. So, you know, once a month, however often they need to deliver. And the company who, the industrial gas company that's delivering can actually call into the tank and get a reading so they can tell when they need to come and refill. So if your storing is liquid, you can store a lot, of, a lot more energy on site. Um, you have to vaporize it, and they just use ambient air. So a vaporizer is a big stainless steel thing with fins coming off of it, and it just uses the ambient air to vaporize from liquid to gas because it's so cold. Once it hits the outside temperature, it just vaporizes. Have to compress it up, store it, and dispense it to the vehicles. You can also make hydrogen on site, as I said, and this station was a Chevron station with the DOE and Hyundai in Chino, California, where they did steam methane reforming. So same process as industry uses, but on a smaller scale. So the um, natural gas that's piped in anyway is put through a reformer in this building, which has or had a stainless steel perforated roof. Why do you think that is? You've got hydrogen production equipment inside that building. If something happened, you'd want it to be able to escape, right? You wouldn't want to trap it. So that was the idea there. Of course, they still had the appropriate detection equipment and so forth, um, but that was sort of an extra item. And then the other thing to point out is the shape of this canopy where the dispenser is, which is behind the car there. Same thing. If there was a significant leak, it wouldn't trap hydrogen. It would let it rise up and dissipate, right? But this here is, um, it might be a regular camera, but they also have flame detectors employed at the stations and the gas sensors inside the fueling cabinet, the dispenser cabinet itself. I'm Jennifer Hamilton, safety and education specialist with the California Fuel Cell Partnership. I was here to educate your first responders on hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles because they're an important part of having a good future for your state and for the country and moving forward with energy security and renewables. And this is um, something that is on the minds of many 
And I know for you in Hawaii, it is on your mind. And I think that Hawaii has a fabulous opportunity to be a real leader in this kind of technology. Uh, as alternative energy sources are developed, our mission is becoming much, much broader than when I first started out. You know, we, we've got hybrid vehicles, we've got uh, PV installations on residential homes and commercial properties, and now hydrogen vehicles are being uh, developed and deployed throughout the country. And so the fire department, as a first responder, needs to know about all these technologies and how to deal with them in case an incident does occur. All in all, we were very impressed with the quality of the instructors and the instruction, the can-do, good-natured attitude of the firefighters, and the training center itself. Clearly, the Honolulu Fire Department is on top of things. And with this training, our firefighters are ready to deal with the risks of hydrogen vehicle fires. Now it remains for General Motors and others to perfect these vehicles and get them on the road, especially here in Hawaii. Although Hawaii has put plenty of time, effort, and investment into renewable energy for power generation, we haven't done as much to develop renewable energy for transportation where we still burn huge amounts of foreign oil. Hydrogen vehicles are a great way to bring renewables to ground transportation in Hawaii. They will have greater range and will give us less range anxiety than pure electric cars. And they will save us billions of dollars in foreign oil. That's why we can hardly wait to get them here and buy them and drive them all over Hawaii. Get ready for a whole new and better experience in ground transportation. Protected, of course, by our well-trained firefighters. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. drive time radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week. Tune into 760 AM for Energy on Wednesday, Asia in Review on Thursday, and ThinkTech Fridays on Friday. Raise your awareness on ThinkTech Radio. On February 28th, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present a luncheon program at the Plaza Club entitled Who's Driving Transportation in Hawaii? And where in the world are we going? Featuring speakers on various modes of air, sea, and land transportation and the issues now in play. Sign up for these programs on hvca.org. And now here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. So what do you want to spensate about today? Well, I think we should tell our audience the news. Um, Think Tech is moving to brand new studio at the Pioneer Plaza building as of March 1st. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Great. It's great to move. Um, there's a big retailer coming into the Davies building, so we have to go. But um, as it worked out, it was a tremendous opportunity for us. And we found great space uh, in the lower level of the Pioneer Plaza building at 900 Fort Street Mall. So we're real happy about that. And we're right now in the process of moving over there, taking our studio equipment, our supplies, all the stuff, you know, that makes up a studio. And uh, we're, we're setting it up over there in the Pioneer Plaza. So I'm really looking forward to that. It'll be nice. I think it's going to be great, um, especially because there's so much happening up in the Plaza Club. Of course, our monthly HVCA Think Tech luncheons, yeah. uh, which will make it easier to keep that going. But I think more importantly, this is a new milestone for Think Tech. Uh, you're going to be able to expand production. Already you're doing how many hours a month of uh, production? Uh, set, well, uh, seven a week, so that's almost 30 hours a month altogether. 30 hours a month. I think that'll be able to increase 
Uh, we're still downtown, close to where the action is, so all those great guests you have on your programs will be able to join in easily. I think it's going to create some new momentum and new opportunities for our loyal uh, listeners to support ThinkTech. Uh, you know, we ha not only have the radio programs three days a week on KGU 760, uh, there are sponsorship opportunities there, and of course, sponsorship opportunities on OC 16. Yeah, we're really looking forward, Bill. This is this will be really terrific. I enjoy the move. You know, it makes you rethink things. It makes you redesign things. It makes you remember things you may have forgotten and improve things you hadn't improved. So altogether, this is going to be a good experience. And everybody around, our hosts, our volunteers, our guests, uh, both radio and television, they're really enjoying this. So um, come on down. It's uh, in the lower level of Pioneer Plaza. Take a look. A transformative change, Jay. You bet. What a great spensation. <laughs> We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the Gas Company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Okay, Maria. That wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Duke. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a sponsor or a volunteer and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. My name is DJ. Think Tech raises public awareness. Mm -hmm.